So um, I get double duty, which is great, with, with two great, three, because we have Pasha joining us. So it's really my great pleasure to introduce this second part of the morning, which is a discussion, a roundtable discussion, addressing a range of issues that I think are super important to the conversation we started this morning. So I'm going to very briefly introduce our three speakers together, and then we'll go straight in. Um, it's my very great pleasure to introduce Chris Dolan, who's been my friend for a really long time. And so it's actually bringing us to Jerusalem together was like a, a, an inspired scheme. And um, Professor Chris Dolan uh, was appointed to the School for Cross-Faculty Studies at the University of Warwick in 2022. But before that, Chris has spent decades um, working in sub-Saharan Africa. And in particular, he led, was both the intellectual force and the um, and the administrator that made everything happen and, and the teacher who I think has created generations of knowledge in Uganda at the Refugee Law Project between 2006 and 2022. And in particular, Chris's work on male sexual survivors of conflict-related sexual violence has shaped our, reshaped our field about how we think about sexual violence against men in armed conflict, um, but also has been really instrumental in shaping global policy around how we understand the impact and the forms and the response that's needed to this violence. So welcome to Chris. And um, I'm also really pleased to uh, introduce Dr. Areen Hawaii, who um, is a doctor PhD in gender studies from Ben Gurion University. And um, Irene's research focuses on activism of Palestinian women um, uh, and addresses issues of feminism, religion, and the state. She's the director of the Gender Studies Proda Program at Mada al Carmel, which I have been listening to and drawing on for many years. So it's really great for her to be here. Um, from the Arab Center for Applied Social Research in Haifa. And I think many of you know, has been a leading Palestinian voice in the field, um, both in civil society and in academia. Um, Irene is currently a postdoctoral fellow at Tel Aviv's university's um, sociology department, and previously a transitional justice postdoctoral fellow at the Hebrew University Minerva Center. Um, she also is a teacher lecturer in the Division of Graduate Studies at Rothberg International School uh, and in the MA, uh, the Global MA program at the Hebrew University. Um, I'm really sorry, Pasha Bueno Hansen is not here in person. Um, Pasha's gonna, um, we're gonna have a short video from Pasha. Um, Pasha is an assistant professor of women and gender studies um, at the University of Delaware. Um, and her doctoral work addresses issues of indigeneity and um, post-colonialism and the centrality of LGBTQI struggles in transitional justice. Um, Pasha's Peruvian, and so her work has really addressed decolonizing transitional justice in the context of Peru, but has, speaks to these other broader issues of who is left in and who is left out of transitional justice processes. So I wish she was with us in person, but maybe next time. So, all right, we're going to start with Chris. <coughs> Thank you very much, <coughs> Finula. And is this on? And, and thank you very much to the organizers of, of today's event. Uh, it's my first time in, in this country, and I, I will not be talking or reflecting on this country because I wouldn't dare. Um, <laughs> but I hope that the, 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 the remarks I make will nonetheless have some sort of traction in the discussion. I think they build very much on, on what Fenula uh, proposed to us in the previous session, um, but looking at it from a, a very particular angle. And when, when I was trying to look for a title for my talk, I, I deliberately avoided using the word gender and chose to instead just simply talk about reimagining transitional justice um, with, with a focus on prosecution, replacing a focus on prosecution with attention to truth telling um, for reasons that, that I hope will kind of come clear. And just to, to sort of give a bit of background to where I'm coming from on these questions, it really stems out of 
as, as Finula said, most of my working life I've been in sub-Saharan Africa, um, so beginning working with Mozambican refugees in South Africa, then with ex-combatants in Mozambique, in the, sort of in the mid-90s, internally displaced persons in northern Uganda in the late 90s and early 2000s, and then Congolese refugees hoping to return to the Democratic Republic of Congo from Tanzania, and latterly the last 16 years with refugees from across the whole Great Lakes region, so all the countries that I've listed there. And during that time from 2006, 2006 just coincided or happened to be the same year that that the government of Uganda and the Lord's Resistance Army, which was the kind of longest running armed group in Uganda, they'd been there since 1986, <coughs> were in peace talks in Juba in, in South Sudan. And at some point in 2006, I forget the date now, they came to a, a peace agreement was drawn up, the government signed and the LRA walked out and Re returned to the bush, as it is referred to. And, but they left Uganda, and they went to Democratic Republic of Congo, and then up to Chad. And the government, um, very, I don't know how, quite how to describe this, but the government then said, we will adhere to what we signed up to in the peace agreements, including that there will be a transitional justice process. And they then proceeded to co-opt the entire transitional justice space from 2008 onwards up to now. And co-opt it in the sense that they, they said, we're, we're developing the policy and then there will be a law. The policy took 10 years to come out. The law is still nowhere in sight. And throughout that period, as part of civil society, we were very restricted in... Well, you know, we were constantly kind of battling against their framing of the issues. So that's where I'm coming from, uh, a kind of a, an experience, a very long experience of state-led co-optation and control over what we like to think would be a progressive discourse, but actually becomes in the interests of a, a perpetuation of a very oppressive regime and it's ensuring its survival by erasing various narratives. The TJ, the so-called pillars. I, I used to have a slideshow where I, I had them as pillars and then I put a fifth one across the top so it started to look like a Greek temple. But <laughs> uh, the, these are the pillars and if you just Google transitional justice, this is, they will tell you that there's number one, truth-telling, number two, prosecution, three, reparations, and four, institutional reforms. But what I've seen, and I think Fanula has also alluded to it, is that it's, it's actually nowhere, nothing like that. <laughs> it's much more like this. And even that, I'm not, I mean, it's very approximate, but truth-seeking, sort of there, just above ground level. Reparations largely falling under the, completely off the map. And you know, there, there is a lot of discussion at the moment about how do we get reparations back into the picture. But frankly, I, I've never seen a good example of repar or a better example of reparations. And I, some years ago now, I think it was about a decade ago, I went to Sierra Leone, and one of the activists that we met with there told us, you know, these prosecutions that we have here cost about $450 million. And I think there were nine people were prosecuted. And they had a victim's register which had 18,000 people on it. And I think their first appeal for money for the reparations, which came out you know, 10 years after the end of the war, they got about $2 million. Or so. It was really absolutely pathetic. So you had prosecutions that cost approximately 45 million per person prosecuted and reparations that amounted to <laughs> approximately $70 per person, including the administration of that process. So that's why I draw that picture the way I draw it. And the, the figures are, 
you know, they were approximate at the time because the exact details of how much has been spent are never quite clear, but it, it was pretty much along these lines. <coughs> so these prosecutions, <coughs> as, as Fenula said very rightly, and this is why I was typing while you were talking. <laughs> it is a discourse that has been captured by lawyers. I think there can be absolutely no debate about that. And the consequences of that are, are pretty grim, really, for truth-telling. First of all, legal proceedings require charging for particular crimes, so you have to have a very clear focus. Secondly, they demand tidy narratives. The testimony has to be consistent from beginning, and it shouldn't change from day one to day 1,000, whatever, how many years the, the case takes, the testimony must not change. So I don't know how many people in this room have been involved in testimony taking, but I've been doing it all my life in one way or another, and where I've had the opportunity to to interact with people around their testimonies over time, I can't think of a testimony that hasn't changed or that hasn't grown. So the key elements maybe stay the same, but the, the co total content changes and adds and grows and gets more complex. And you know, th there just is no space for the reality of traumatized memory and the fragmentation of the memory through trauma. The space is not there, whether in court, whether in a, an asylum process. Of course, working with refugees, you're constantly dealing with people who can't remember exactly what happened. But that is taken as evidence that they're, they're not genuine. Whereas actually, it should be the proof that they're genuine is the fact they can't remember exactly what happened because it was so traumatic. So we have a complete, everything is inverted. It's all the wrong way around. Even Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, they don't properly accommodate what I would call the phased disclosure of harms. So it's not just about traumatic memory. People maybe remember very clearly what happened, but that doesn't mean that they're able or willing to disclose it all at once or at all. And certainly not within the three years that most truth and reconciliation commissions operate for. I can think of quite a number of examples of male survivors that I've worked with whose story has kind of emerged interacting just with me, somebody they trusted, over 10 years. So I've often wondered, how would that person have told their story in a not in three years, because they wouldn't have three years to tell it. They'd have a moment within a three-year institutional arrangement to tell a story that actually can take at least a decade. I also know of, in, in male survivors generally, not talking about conflict here, but male survivors of childhood sexual abuse and trauma often don't disclose for 50 years, 60 years. They disclose when they're really old men. And they've just spent their whole lives sitting on it. So we have a real problem in terms of tidy narratives and the expectation of, of tidy narratives. Next problem, again, tidiness, a clear victim-perpetrator dichotomy. And this is massively challenging. One of the commanders of the Lord's Resistance Army in Uganda, a guy called Dominic Onwen, who has been through, he's been, he was the only one that the, ever got arrested. He actually surrendered, I think, but we're told he was arrested. <coughs> but who's gone to the International Criminal Court. Um, you know, there were, there were lots of questions raised by the defense and, and other thinking people, I would say, <laughs> around the fact that this Dominic you know, was abducted as a child. And by the time he was an adult, I think he'd spent at least eight or nine years as a child soldier. 
So his kind of key formative period of his life was as an abducted child soldier. And you know, there are endless narratives out there if you want to find them about the brutalization processes adopted by the Lord Resistance Army, including beating your fellow abductees to death and cutting off people's lips and their ears and whatever. So they were like, how do we how do we deal with the fact that this person hits 18 and suddenly is supposed to be kind of rational and responsible in a liberal individual sense and and that somehow he personally is going to be able to erase a decade of brutalization. We have a real problem, I think. So I, 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 I would describe it as a kind of psychological fairyland. <laughs> I just don't know quite what to, how else to capture my frustration with, with all of this. Because I mean, I just think it's such nonsense. <laughs> Truly nonsense. And, you know, the law, and Fenula correct me, because I'm not a lawyer, but I mean, there is this obsession with intention. Absolutely obsessed with intention. And to me, that, you know, it reproduces one of the tropes of hyper-masculinity, which is that real men stay cool under fire, right? So all the things that happen in people's minds, physiologically, the hormones that are triggered by intense fear, I mean, all of that is just out the window. Somehow you're supposed to be there, and everything you've done, you've thought about it, you've reasoned it out, and you did whatever you did intentionally. So again, I, I, mean, I think this is a massive problem. And then, and I think Fenula kind of touched on this as well, we have a transitional justice infrastructure, at least internationally, that, well, internationally and locally now, that reproduces key aspects of, of colonialism and co-optation that actually run counter to any notion of global institutional reform or, or <coughs> domestic transition. And again, let me take the example of Uganda. So Uganda very proudly hosted the 10th anniversary of the Rome Statute. There was a big conference, and then they signed. Uh, most of the, the Rome Statute was incorporated into domestic law, so all the good things happened. And then they went about, and they set up their mini or domestic ICC, and it's called the International Crimes Division. And yet the ICC insisted on continuing with the trial of Dominic Nguyen because, in their view, Uganda was not either able or willing. No, it wasn't able. They were willing. They wanted to try him at home. But the ICC said, no, you're not able. So they undermined the, their own, the, own, the principle of complementarity, which is written into the Rome Statute which is that the ICC should only be there where the domestic guys are unable and unwilling, unable or unwilling. So we had a very kind of classic example of other agendas intervening and conflicting with what was provided for in the statute. So you know, to sort of summarize all of that, I just think the sequencing has gone completely mad and, and it's Totally, and this is just echoing, I did write it before I heard you, but it's echoing what Finula said. It's delinked, completely delinked from the lived experiences and the very real needs of the overwhelming majority of victims and survivors. And even those people that are lucky enough to have their day in court only get to tell their, that bit of the narrative which was charged right at the beginning. So I think we have instances from Sierra Leone, again, where, um, Fenula, you'll know this in more detail than I do, but w women survivors who hadn't told that part of the story, of including of sexual violence, at the right moment, and who then wanted to talk about it later, and they were told to keep quiet. And it was not allowed, they couldn't bring it in as evidence. So what does that mean, all of the proceeding, for victims in need of justice? Well, activists and international organizations have done considerable work, 
to, to seek to draw attention to particular aspects of women's victimization in conflict settings, notably victimization through sexual violence. And again, I'm, I'm echoing the previous presentation. This morning, when I was putting these slides together, I went to the, the website of the Office of the Special Representative of the Secretary General on Sexual Violence in Conflict, with which I have worked for the last 12 years, in a, not, not in a paid capacity, I hasten to add, but I've interacted with them a lot and done a lot of advocacy, and this is what they come up with. So when you go there, there are those 10 little buttons and the sort of rolling slideshow. I didn't catch all 10 of them just for want of space, but literally there's one with some male-bodied people in it out of the 10 photos. And they are peacekeepers that I imagine the office is working with to change their, their masculinity and engaging them in the struggle against violence against women. I don't think they're there as a group of military or peacekeeper victims of sexual violence. So I want to try and bring two particular aspects of men's victimization into this discussion. And I, I, there, there are two dimensions which I, I think should command attention from all current or if you're aspiring practitioners of transitional justice. Firstly, sexual violence against men, which is so hidden that many people don't even believe it can happen or that it happens. <laughs> they don't even believe it can happen, let alone that it actually does happen. Secondly, and more contentiously, I should think, content, uh, is militarization, which is so visible, and the way I see it, so normalized, that we don't even see it as a problem. <laughs> and, you know, I, I don't have time to get into exactly how this arrow works, but <laughs> there is an arrow between the two, a pretty big one. So just to just to give you a glimpse of sexual violence against men, this is data from our screenings in Uganda of different nationality refugees or countries of origin, Sudanese, South Sudanese, orange, blue for Congolese, and yellow for Burundians. And you can see that, of course, the, the distribution by different forms is different by different nationalities. There are definitely variations in these kind of patterns. But the overall shape of the is pretty similar. Forced nudity, unwanted sexual touching, genital harm, rape, forced masturbation, sexual slavery, being forced to commit sexual violence, being forced to masturbate someone else, being used as a mattress, so you're put down on the floor, then your wife is put on top of you, and then she's raped by the people that have forced you onto the floor. Survival sex, being forced into marriage. This is a big issue, it was a big issue with Pol Pot in Cambodia. Forced bestiality, being forced to impregnate women. So you can see this is where we need the extended vocabulary of harms that Fenula was talking about. But this is just, these are all, I would group them as sexual violence. But rape is only. It's, it's fairly high up there, it's at the higher end, but it's by no means the only or the dominant one. When we come to, normally this slide says impacts, but, but I'm, like, I'm talking about masculinities, they're all emasculation, they're all different dimensions of emasculation. From that long list that I just gave you of different forms that we have seen in large numbers. Physical and medical impacts. Um, well, you can probably imagine if you have difficulties with urinating and defecating, you're not going to feel very confident. You're not going to stride out there into public spaces. If you've got rectal prolapse, if you're incontinent, etc. Erectile and sexual dysfunction. Psychological impacts are often described under post-traumatic stress disorders. 
all of this long list we, we see a lot, suicidal ideation and actual suicides. When I first started trying to research this in northern Uganda, and I asked a northern Ugandan colleague who'd worked at a community level for, she was from that community for decades, and I said, where are the men? And she said, well, we've, we've tried to find them, but quite often when we get to the, where they're supposed to be, we find that they've actually committed suicide. And so there was a, a kind of gap in the evidence right there because people had actually removed themselves from that space. So it's not just ideation, it's actual uh, successful attempts. Psychosexual impacts, impotence, major reproductive challenges. If you've got erectile and sexual dysfunction and then your wife is expecting another child, wants you to give her another child and you just can't, you're emasculated. End of story. And you know, I've worked with enough men where when you come together as a group, with especially with with their wives, most of the discussion revolves around children and men who've had some sort of recovery process standing up and saying, and you see, she's pregnant. You know, it's a it's a huge, huge issue if that capacity is gone. Psychosocial issues around withdrawal from the family, exclusion from the community, being unable to work, being unable to provide, impoverishment, a whole crisis of masculinity, and often connected with domestic violence, intimate partner violence. Not always in the direction that we assume, sometimes coming the other direction of you know frustrated family members taking out their frustrations on this useless man who can't provide and can't send the kids to school, can't get them new clothes, all of those things. And then there's a political dimension um, that is, is under-documented, I would say, and more difficult to document. But sort of, there is no doubt that um, some of the people that we've worked with have described being pass adopting kind of strategies of passive resistance, finding their own ethnic beliefs and religious and nationalistic beliefs reinforced or changed, and, and resultant perpetuation of violence, cycles of violence. And you know, we, there was a recent discussion with somebody from Ukraine where you know, we're supposed to come out of the war and we're war heroes. But the minute that you, if you say you're, you're raped, you're not a hero anymore, you're just a loser. Even if that rape was done to you while you were a prisoner of war. And then yet another layer that we don't normally talk about is that when, when you put all of that emasculation together, with all the dysfunction that it creates, how that then transfers onto the next generation and those men's children. So this is, it's terribly summarized, but gives you the, the kind of the, the, the basic map that we, we see. And my second area, militarization, which I, I'm not going to talk about so extensively, but just to sort of flag it up, and suggest how it connects to the sexual violence. So jumping away from my own direct experience in sub-Saharan Africa, I mean, this has just been all over the news. Ever since February 2022, when we, we learned that Ukrainian men were not allowed to leave Ukraine because they were needed. And more recently, we've had coverage of Russian men trying to get out of Russia because conscription is going up and out as, as, as Russia deals, tries to deal with Ukraine. So you have this kind of very, this, these are not the best images, but it was just to make the point, you kind of really graphic images of thousands of men queuing up at border points and sometimes being turned back actually by, by the authorities in the countries they're trying to get into. So that, that, that part of the gendering of militarization, I think, has been really interesting and kind of sad that it's being reproduced in 2022 on a massive scale. I then looked up abduction. Um, 
you end up, it's interesting, you end up with lots of abduction of children. That, that guy here, this is the famous Joseph Carney who kind of ran the, the Lord's Resistance Army and is still at large. But, you know, very, very notorious for abduction, forcible abduction of children, particularly boys for, as war, uh, as soldiers, and girls as uh, sex slaves. But in the pictures, what you get is all these boys, most of whom also happen to be black. If you try to look up abduction of men, <laughs> you get a much more limited kind of list, set of lists. Um, and it quickly goes back to children. So even, even just looking at abduction of men for military purposes, it's actually quite hard to find something at first glance when you try to Google it, which I think tells us something. What I want to just sort of, and this is very summarized, but from the narratives I've heard, and I did interview hundreds of ex-combatants in Mozambique, as I told you at the beginning, you know, they, they all res regarded themselves on both sides, the government side and the rebel side, they all regarded themselves as forcibly recruited, all of them. For the army, the government side, it was conscription with no choice. And for the rebels, it was abduction. But when you talk to them, they understood each other as brothers that had experienced the same imposition on themselves of just being taken and some landed on this side some landed on that and some were actually were biological brothers who just got picked up by different sides at different times then you have the brutalization and this is not just in sub-saharan africa and we know all about boot camps what i would describe as the weaponization of the male body and then bringing it back to sexual, viol <laughs> sexual violence, the, a very particular way of weaponizing the male body is forcing men to penetrate other people against their will. And you know, this, I've talked with a number of men that this has happened to. And of all the many people that I've interviewed in my career, they, they were the most destroyed individuals that I'd ever come across. Because it, it, it seems that the male body can be triggered to perform in terms of being sufficiently erect to penetrate under extreme duress and even to ejaculate. And you know, this is a physiological thing. It's, it's like women lubricating when they're getting raped. The body responds to particular forms of fear. It triggers particular processes. So in the case of men, apparently, and as I say, we, we don't get to film this, but we get to hear about it. It can permit people to erect even when there's a gun at their, particularly when there's a gun at their head, pointing at their head. And so, as I wrote about in the handbook that, that Fenula edited, you know, when, when you know that vast majorities of people in a particular military group have been abducted, they've been forcibly recruited, they've been brutalized. Then you wonder, you know, what, what, what is their role in the sexual violence? What was their intention? Was there an intention there? Or was there a fear prompted by the, the coercive circumstances under which they were living? And I don't know the answer, but I put it as a question. And jumping back to the law, I mean, in the law, you have these theories of command responsibility, which are kind of, again, they, they allow lawyers to tidy up the mess and you know, find the people that were responsible uh, and gave orders or allowed it to happen without stopping it. But they don't tackle the, the damage done to men whose bodies have been weaponized and who even if they could be considered as victims, and under the Rome Statute, many of these men would be victims, actually. They often believe themselves to be perpetrators, too. And that's part of how they're, that's why they're such sort of shadow people. 
It's because their sense of their, their own selves as moral beings has been absolutely destroyed. Because they're wondering, like, how on earth, how on earth was I able to rape my own grandmother? How can I live with myself knowing that I did that? And then going back to the discussion about reparations, and I mean, nobody talks about reparations for ex-combatants, but they do talk about reintegration processes. But I can tell you from the ones that I have witnessed, they, they are totally inadequate, both in a broad sort of psychosocial sense of what do people get and whether it allows them to actually make up for 15 years spent in some military they didn't choose to be part of. But more profoundly, like, does it give you back the 15 years in a sense of that you've got any sense of a future direction? Many of the ones who lost 15 years, they, they were taken out of school before they'd finished any kind of schooling, so they, they're semi-literate. And now they're kind of, they're, they're losing their reproductive physical strength, and they've got very little to fall back on. And what you end up with, uh, in northern Uganda, what we, we saw quite a lot of was that ex-combatants were regrouping post coming back to northern Uganda. And not just the, not just the, all these kind of former boy soldiers, now young men, f sort of create their own ghetto, but the women were joining them as well. The women who we describe as sex slaves are joining up with the, 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 the men who were abducted as boys. So you have a kind of very complex picture there about, which tells you that the needs of those people are clearly not being addressed in any systematic way, and they're finding their own solutions, which is that they only actually feel comfortable or safe together because the broader society hasn't actually done its job of bringing them back into the fold. So sort of, I'm coming close to the end, but the silencing of sexual violence against men, the hyper-visibility -vis of militarization of men, they both reflect gender norms and resultant attempts to perform related masculinities. So whether in terms of performing masculinity as an armed man or as a man that doesn't disclose what happened and tries to kind of just, you know, keep silent, all of that relates to masculinities. And if we remain willfully blind to the gender natures of, of, of these harms, I think our just attempts to do justice will remain partial, incomplete, and ineffective. Um, TJ is supposed to be all about non-recurrence. <laughs> um, but I, I just don't see how you can get non-recurrence when you haven't tackled this massive dynamic, which is actually, you know, I, I, I'm not a believer in vampire myths that, you know, because there was sexual violence, that person's going to go out and commit sexual violence. But in a broader sense, I, I do think that these, there are cycles of violence which are definitely being fueled by our lack of attention to some of these dynamics. And, and so I, again, I struggled for the right title to this slide. I, I, first I thought of it as kind of pre-TJ, some sort of foundational work. But more broadly, I actually think it demands this reimagination or reconceptualization of where, where does transitional justice begin and end? And, you know, from, in terms of the particular dynamics that I've been working on, our first step is you have to really start talking about deconstructing gender norms. You have to retrain a whole range of professionals, the medics, the counselors, the police, the people doing reintegration, the people doing resettlement. All of those people need retraining because they're working with unreconstructed gender norms. Even when they think they're working in a progressive direction because they're, they're pursuing gender equality, inverted commas. The particular case of male survivors, you need medical support. Incredibly difficult to provide medical support if you haven't done the retraining beforehand. The majority of doctors that you send a male survivor to they're just, 
in many contexts, not just in Uganda, you know, they just don't understand, and they're very likely to sort of ridicule and not believe and all those problems. And then you need an awful lot of psychosocial interventions. And I can say this not just for male survivors, but from all the work I've done over the last 15 years, in North, 20 years in northern Uganda, people want this long before they want prosecutions. And until that is there, the prosecutions are really almost irrelevant. If you do all of that, then you start to see a demand for prosecutions. So, you know, I've come to, to see it. I mean, Tal talked about practices of hope. These are the practices of hope, much more than these. And if you've got these in place, then these start to actually make more sense and have more, more content, if you like. Um, and fundamentally, it's about that. There's your transition. It's a transition from silence or being silenced to being acknowledged. That, to me, is the core of transitional justice. And much of this doesn't do it. So it's, it's, you really have to look at that transition, silence to acknowledgement. And without that, all of these are very, they're pillars on sand, I think. That, ladies, ladies, that is it. That, <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, thanks to Chris, and now we go to Eric. Right. My name is Pasha Bueno Hansen, and this presentation is entitled A Transitional Justice Gender Redux. In this presentation, I am bringing together some reflections and thoughts that are based off of my book manuscript and process entitled Dissident Genders and Sexualities in the Andes and a um, chapter contribution to an edited volume entitled Masculinities and Queer Perspectives in Transitional Justice edited by Philip Schulz, Brandon Hammer, and Helen Touquet. And um, also my thoughts that I'll be presenting today are based on um, a framework that I presented in an article entitled The Emerging LGBTI Rights Challenge to Transitional Justice in Latin America. So I'm gonna start by um, sort of building out a little bit with regard to my chapter contribution to the edited volume, Masculinities and Queer Perspectives in Transitional Justice, which brings us to the case of Ecuador. So the chapter contribution that I prepared for that edited volume is entitled, The Heterosexual System Denuded, Ecuador's Truth Commission. So um, just to bring you in a little bit to the case of Ecuador, which is, um, largely unknown, Ecuador had a truth commission that was mandated by um, President Rafael Correa, and it, it was mandated um, to research the political repression that took place under the Febres Cordero administration in the 80s. And then that um, investigative process was expanded and extended to 2008. And the whole, as, as many commissions end up doing, like stretching their time frame. So in total, the commission um, was active between 2008 and 2011. And as is the case in many commissions, uh, there was a belated inclusion of a gender analysis and attention to sexual violence. And that was of course due to a lot of advocacy and efforts to um, fill the gap, right? That initially, was not considered in the in the mandate or the research design that was created by the commissioners. Um, what's particularly interesting about the gender analysis that was incorporated belatedly was that it was a feminist movement based gender analysis. The person that ended up being um, contracted as a gender consultant 
was a woman named Tatiana Cordero, and she and she passed away recently, and um, she was a veteran feminist activist and lesbian activist in Ecuador, and was part of various different really foundational groupings, collectives, and initiatives um, in the in the decades in which she was active. Anyway, so when she when she came into this process of identifying, you know, what what is the differential impact of of the of the political repression in Ecuador, and um, what how do we look at the issue of sexual violence? She was very clear about focusing on the workings of the heterosexual system as a way of conceptually entering into this terrain, and that that's anchored in her um, activist praxis. And what this heterosexual system um, really helped her to highlight is that all the different varied manifestations of gender and sexual violence against all people, men, women, and LGBTI people, comes from the same root. And that authoritarian regimes <laughs> exacerbate gender social hierarchies. And I found this to be particularly insightful and important. And this is really the piece that I want to highlight in this redux. The idea that we need to seriously consider these um, movement-based foundational ways of understanding gender in transitional justice. So when um, Tatiana Cordero was referring to the heterosexual system, we can trace that also to Judith Butler's heterosexual matrix and Adrian Rich's compulsory heterosexuality. And again, this is the refresher, right? The bringing back the idea that, you know, our society is organized in this hierarchical, hierarchical way in which bodies that are born are sexed, they're designated and assigned, and assigned a sex, which aligns with a particular type of gender role that um, must be taken on and must and must be um, accommodated and aligned with the designated sex. And then when it comes to sexual behavior and orientation, that is um, towards the opposite sex. So that framework, right? And um, when you when you look at the specifics of what happened in Ecuador, um, and you look at the at the way in which the gender chapter in the final report of the Ecuadorian Truth Commission's work analyzes the gender and sexual violence and sort of the broader um, dynamics of the political repression, it the chapter always brings it back to understanding the relationality. With, with and through this heterosexual system. For example, um, state agents tortured women as a quote, punishment for breaking the hegemonic gender order. So for example, um, women who were militants who were part of subversive groups who clearly stepped out of their traditional appropriate normative roles of mother, sacrificial mother, daughter, so forth, through the gendered and sexual torture were forced back into that role. That is the only way that one must be. Men were, were tortured for undermining the social order and the most powerful tool that, um, that, what, that, that was identified in this investigation <clears throat> Um, to dominate these men was to um, threaten rape or rape them. And this was understood from the perspective of the people who gave testimony, the male victims, as an experience of having their male privilege ripped away from them by converting them into a feminized role which would then default associate them with homosexuality. So the punishment for those males was to force them over to the, to the subjugated role of the female. 
And um, the chapter goes on to, to analyze um, sexual and gender discrimination and violence against LGBTI population. Um, and there's an example there that was very powerful in Guayaquil, um, a, a, a public security uh, campaign in which um, state agents uh, initiated a social cleansing of the city and particularly trans women in public spaces in addition to the overlap with um, sex workers and um, people who were considered um, as violating public morality. So trans women clearly not, you know, already violating all of these categories, inherently being unacceptable and needing extermination. So these were the pieces, so these were the pieces that of, of the manifestations of the heterosexual system in its most violent and brutal form that the chapter brought together as relational pieces. And then of course, the overarching um, argument that authoritarian regimes exacerbate the violence of this heterosexual system. So in thinking about what, um, what was presented in that final report with regard to gender and also sexual violence, um, the question of the historical context is, is very relevant. And I wanna kind of pan out and talk about our current historical moment, right? In, with the rise of authoritarianism and in particular in Latin America, um, how this is further reinforcing um, hetero, the heterosexual system. And I have a little quote here to share from um, the work of Sonia Correa in Policy Watch based out of Brazil in this really fantastic book called Anti-Gender Politics in Latin America. And this little quote I'll read here, the preservation or restoration of deeply racialized or unequal gender and sexual sexuality orders lies at the core of democratic erosions and extreme right word shifts sweeping across the regional landscape. So here I just wanna reiterate we're in a context specifically of a very strong backlash against gains for women and LGBT, LGBT people and marginalized populations in general. And we are witnessing very strong um, conservative religious and political commitment to reasserting the heterosexual system. And we can all probably think of multiple examples of how this is playing out in um, the regions in which we find ourselves. In Latin America, clearly, there's um, the gender ideology campaigns that have been um, quite notable, in especially in Colombia and and Ecuador, Brazil, and so on, Peru. So, um, what my goal here, in terms of thinking about the transitional justice gender. Redux is to incite a redoubled commitment to identifying and addressing the systemic dynamics that undergird gender and sexual violence, which, you know, are the focus very much of transitional justice gender investigations, and to reinforce and redouble our commitment to understanding the interconnected and relational nature of violent manifestations of this heterosexual system. So with, um, with the time remaining that I have, I would like to make the case of why we really need to redouble our commitment. And I'm gonna do that through a quick sketch of the current state of the field and the existing critiques and what I consider to be the current gender quagmire in transitional justice. And um, I will briefly close by um, highlighting some very um, brief comments about the few, few other further contributions from a queer feminist intersectional and decolonial analysis. Um, today, I'm really focusing just on the queer feminist um, because this is the sort of foundational piece of the redux for today, but the intersectional and decolonial really are interwoven and can't be separated from it. So in terms of the state of the field, I'll rehearse a couple sort of, you know, 
widely commented and written about points. Here we have, you know, a couple decades of gender mainstreaming in which um, there's been sort of an identification of the gender, gender differential of the impact, impact of armed conflict. And I'll expand that to be to, to include political violence and political repression. And this um, somewhat myopic attention to sexual violence that it, you know, we know the critiques around that to, to um, have concerns about being very violence centric. Um, we've also um, witnessed an uh, increased attention to the intersectional approach as a way of challenging homogenous assumptions about women. And, uh, and I just want to um, direct your attention to a piece that I published recently with Juliana Gonzalez that discusses this question of mainstreaming intersectionality an example of the Colombian um, peace process. And then of course, um, lastly, but you know, significantly is this sort of nascent intention to masculinities and LGBT, LGBTI populations. So um, I think that this, this quote by Fabian Salvioli, um, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Promotion of Truth, Justice, Reparation and Guarantees of Non-Reoccurrence really helps us to capture this sort of um, aspirational goals of gender and transitional justice as they are being articulated now, you know, just a few years ago, 2020, and, and towards sort of our, our goals and our reference points moving forward. He writes, a gender perspective requires the complex experiences of sexual and gender-based violence, not only of women, but also of men and of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender persons to be consciously and duly recognized and captured by any transitional justice measures that have been designated and implemented, taking into account the criterion of intersectionality. Otherwise, the process of truth-seeking, comprehensive reparation, guarantees of non-repetition and memorialization would be incomplete. So, so the question is, how do we, how do we do this? How do we get to this place? And my argument is we need a gender redux. Um, so some of the on, you know, ongoing well-known critiques that we're aware of is um, how there's been overall a default assumption that gender is used as just a holder for women, um, that addressing women has been a piecemeal add-on approach on the edges of transitional justice mechanisms efforts in the field and also um, in the literature. And that of course the default assumption of the homogenous woman is highly problematic and has um, started to be addressed through an intersectional approach. Um, much ink has been spilled about the problems with the gender binary that reinforce female victimhood and male perpetration. And along with that goes concerns about the violence centric analysis that exists in the practice in the field of transitional justice. Um, my key concerns are that, you know, as, as much as it is really critically important to um, disaggregate the, the information that is collected through transitional justice mechanisms and understand how, um, how harms are, are differentially um, experienced by men, women, and LGBTI populations. My concern is that by um, creating these distinct categories, while that is important in its own right, conceptually, it leads to a potential sense of disconnected parts rather than a relationality between these different manifestations of um, gender and sexual based violences. And when we um, have this sort of disconnected parts, sort of very sort of uh, technocratic approaches to this type of work, we lose the fact that the heterosexual matrix or the heterosexual system is a default reference that actually maintains the violence in place. And here again, we have this heterosexual system. Again, it's also, we could also call it heterosexual matrix um, in the words of Judith Butler, 
just as a refresher to remember what it is we're talking about. Um, and this leads me to my concern with what I'm calling the gender quagmire, which is, um, I think all of us could probably agree that that we've we've seen this drive, and we, we the dominant approach is to fill the gaps, right? Fill the gap of um, women not being addressed in these processes, and now we're looking at you know needing to fill the gap for male victims and fill the gap around LGBT victims, and that this dominant framework is more of an add-on and piecemeal approach. My concern with this sort of, this state of affairs is that it maintains not the, the heterosexual system, but let's sort of deepen that to consider that this is a Western-centric cis and heteronormative status quo in the field. And this visual kind of helps to, to see how the heterosexual system and all of its sort of Western-centric cis and heteronormativity is the definitional center of the field and practice of transitional justice. And we have these sort of add on the margin efforts, but they stay on the margin and they don't really redefine the center. So how can we do that, right? Um, my concerns here that is that we need to we need to figure out how to think our way out of um, a decontextualized false equivalence of victimhood that doesn't necessarily always consider structural violences and systemic violences that may um, unfortunately exacerbate fault lines within the field and practice among female victims and their advocates, male victims and their advocates, and of course, LGBTI victims and their advocates. And I'm going back to this to kind of explain what I mean. So in the current state of affairs, you know, we've had several decades of um, women's rights activists and feminist activists pushing on many different fronts to get women recognized within um, the field and practice of transitional justice. So we have some um, some added on the margins efforts, which is a co constant battle, right? And then more recently, we've had um, LGBTI populations um, advocating and activating to recognize that they exist and that they're also been harmed, right? And in the case of women in LGBTI populations, we've also seen sort of this narrow funneling into gender and sexual violence as the way into recognition. Now, what happens here is that we've seen, especially, and I'm specifying some um, thoughts about you know various examples out of Colombia, where um, indeed in the peace processes there has been. Um, some inclusion of LGBTI populations. But unfortunately, some of the reactions out of the women's and feminist movement advocacy is through what you might call scarcity mindset in which the idea of integrating LGBTI people, victims and recognition of their harms is considered somehow losing ground and losing terrain for the um, battles being fought to include women and, and women's um, women 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 victims. So what happens here is that we've seen unfortunate sort of um, activations of homo, lesbo and transphobia in which, the LGBTI groups then feel further discriminated and marginalized and further further embattled in their struggle. And this is of deep concern and that's something we have to pay close attention to. And then here we've had also recently more attention to including male victims of gender and sexual violence. And here, this is also extremely complicated in another way 
in that, it, um, again, thinking about a, a, a colleague telling me about the um, a recent presentation event in Medellin of the final report of the Colombian Truth Commission and the issues around gender and discussion that um, that there was a dynamic in which um, male victims and their advocates being present and 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 explaining you know their positioning ended up also activating complicated dynamics in that in the in the unfortunate <laughs> scarcity mindset of saying well you know we've been fighting for women's rights and women's recognition and all of a sudden these men are showing up to talk about their victimhood and again having this idea of well we're losing our terrain because now men are going to take it over then the 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 male um, victims and their advocates feeling oppressed by the women victims and their advocates and then that of course claiming male oppression by feminists creates even a more complicated and difficult dynamic and the lack of recognition of systemic and structural privilege and how that plays out and why there would be these kinds of conflicts um, from a broader perspective get lost. So here we have this sort of very complex situation. And if we think about it with taking a step further back, all of that sort of infighting and um, lack of capacity of comprehension of the, of the broader joint um, concerns um, that all serve to sort of divide these different groupings and efforts end up really serving the heterosexual system. So in we so my sense is that we must actively redouble our efforts to comprehend these broader systemic and structural dynamics so that we don't inadvertently reinforce the exact kinds of problematic dynamics that we're, we we are fighting against. So in in trying to kind of group this all together what I find very useful about a feminist, a queer feminist analysis is that it helps us to identify the heterosexual system and the interconnected and relational nature of its violent manifestations. And it helps us to understand how it functions as a political institution to support authoritarianisms. And a big piece of that is to also um, to reinforce this sort of scarcity add on piecemeal model in which everyone is fighting for a little to hang on to the edges of the, the broader system and how critically important it is for us to think about this, denaturalize this system and subvert it in our work. So in closing, I, I don't have time to elaborate on these other interwoven, really critically important components of the approach that um, I would suggest we consider. Um, but I do want to mention that the intersectional analysis is particularly um, important because it layers together with this sort of analysis of the heterosexual system, the geo and biopolitical specificities of struggle for justice, peace and liberation. And that also interweaves and interlinks with the decolonial analysis, which assists us in mapping colonial legacies, recuperating indigenous ways of knowing, and mobilizing collective imaginaries and futurities to be able to overcome this current gender quagmire that we have in our field and practice. And lastly, um, along with these approaches comes um, an accountability in the production of knowledge and an awareness of um, what we would call our social positionalities or um, working with Donna Haraway's methodological approach of situated knowledge and also thinking about what does it take to do coalitional politics and how can we think about through Bernice Johnson Reagan's conception the kinds of difficult 
and lots of times, un, you know, discomforting positions we need to acknowledge in order to expand and connect across differences so that we can make the change that we hope to be part of. And of course, to wrap this all together, we have to understand north-south power asymmetries and account for them and be transparent about them. Thank you very much for your time and attention, and I hope you find this presentation useful. I wish Pasha were here, because she's quite amazing, and uh, hopefully she'll get to come again. First, I would like to thank my uh, friends and colleagues in Minerva Center and the Sophie Davis Forum for this invitation. And I would, I must say that I'm honored to talk after Funella and Chris and Pacha. It's really honored. So thank you very much. Um, you know, transitional justice. Um, uh, I didn't talk about my, the the title of my presentation, so I'm, I'm approaching transitional justice or gendering transitional justice from a perspective of Palestinian scholar, and to talk about the way we can talk about making transitional justice in scholarship, in feminist scholarship. So transitional justice in the Palestinian context it has different meanings, of course. We are not talking about a situation of political transition, but about an existing settler colonial regime. This regime is practiced in different ways according to different political geographies. This means for me that this means for me that in order to be engaged when with in, with gendering transitional justice within this context, I'm challenged first by the fact by this fact, and second by the fact that the problem in this context is not gendering transitional justice, but rather re reaching processes of transitional justice. Transitional justice in this case means <coughs> decolonization and changing the political reality according to which seven million Palestinians live with about seven million Israelis, Jewish Israelis, in the land of historic Palestine. Among them, seven million Jews, who are about 47% of the population, have full citizenship and have political sovereignty over themselves, but also over the Palestinians. While four and a half million Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza Strip live without a status of citizens, but are besieged, besieged, besieged in Gaza Strip or live under occupation with a semi-civilian authority in the West Bank, as you just said, so of course. While about 350,000 about 350, Palestinians of Jerusalem live under uh, the threat of the displacement from their home and from their city. As for the rest, about more than 1 million and uh, 1 million, 1.7 million, of whom I am one, live as a second class citizens in a country that does not even define itself as their state, but rather as a state of the Jews citizens and non-citizens. However, based on the above perspective, which believe that transitional justice requires, in our case, first decolonization, the return of the Palestinian refugees, and later talking about historical reconciliation. Based on this, and from the transitional justice perspective, as a Serenity scholar, I will talk about the research on Palestinian women as indigenous women who became minority within their homeland. I want to bring some questions and, and challenges that I faced theoretically as a researcher. Challenges I faced first when I wanted to define my and position my research group, and later when I examined the academic literature that would help me understand the positions and the struggles of the Palestinian women in Israel especially in questions related to gender and religion, my field of research. I will, I will address briefly the literature on Palestinian women that was clear to me that it is not suitable, or that it is not correct, or that it is not scientific, but actually ideological, that consciously or unconsciously supporting the, the oppressive political power and hegemonic groups. And then I will give some basic principles that I think it's important to adopt when we do feminist research on Palestinian women from a transitional justice perspective. Before that, 
I want to start with drawing the attention to a new, or maybe not new, you will tell us, angle of approaching gender, gendering transitional justice. In this case, and I'd, unlike the debate that focuses on promoting the presence of women in transitional justice, or the politics of presence in both meanings, like making women's concerns and women's experience as legitimate objects of transitional justice attention, <laughs> and also promoting women as actors in the transitional justice processes, which I totally agree with, of course. But here I would like to continue the call to extend gender justice framework, which draws the attention, like just draws the attention to the LGBT concerns and to resist the nor uh, heteronormative systems and to look at men also as victims, which again, I totally agree with. And I just told Chris that I wrote my a thesis presentation for master's degree about constructing masculinity of the Palestinian men in Israel uh, during the military regime times. So, and I read the men uh, as victims, not on, not sexually, but as gender the group, mm -hmm. as as gender uh, and their gender roles with which it intersect with the colonial and class system. So, I want I want to continue this uh, this wave. I want to address the importance of approaching women not only as victims or political actors and advocating for transitional justice, but also as oppressors and colonialists and perpetrators. Gendering transitional justice should be also aware of this fact. Like you talked about the binary between victim and, uh, and oppressor. So we should challenge this, that uh, when we deal with the women as we should deal with women, gendering uh, transitional justice should also be aware of this fact and deal with women as accountable and as responsible in oppressive systems and in oppressive politics. We hesitate when we talk about women as victims or only as victims in order not to reinforce the patriarchal systems or values, which is very true. However, it is important to be aware and bear in mind that women can be part and sometimes central players in the colonialist power or in ethnic cleansing, cleansing operations or as war criminals or in acts of looting lands and other resources. And they could be part of the beneficiaries of these crimes. So while we believe that women concerns should be addressed and while we believe that women should be part of the political actors and decision makers, we and the post-colonial countries or the colonized people believe that women should be also accountable and taking responsibility of injustice systems, policies, and practices. Feminist scholarship should deal with women as part of repressive politics and as, project, as objects of criminal justice, as criminals and not only as victims or agents for transformative justice. Women would be heads could be heads of governments that practice oppressions. They may be queens in kingdoms that ruled to internize dozens of, dozens of countries and people. They may be foreign ministers or in other high positions in the armies in countries occupying people. Of course, transitional justice does not ignore the fact that women could be part. But I mean, feminist engagement should address and acknowledge that and should deal with the way women are involved in these oppressive powers. We agree that women experience repression differently, but maybe we should see whether they exercise repression differently than men. In some cases, women could act in more or at least not less violent and oppressive ways to prove their gender competence or could perform other gender roles in these systems, not as victims or unprivileged. Women may also use or abuse their sexualities in the service of oppressive projects. In some cases, even women who define themselves feminist promoted law or judicial ruling to enable women to hold high positions in armies in countries that practice oppression and oppressive politics. Among them are some Israeli feminists who petitioned the High Court of Justice to allow women to participate in elite pilot course in the Israeli army, while Israel violates the most basic international treaties 
and resolutions. Intersectional analysis and engagement. Sorry, was my, can I have my water, please? Yeah. Thank you. Intersectional analysis and engagement is important academically and politically. Because it reminds us that women are not one group and that women from oppressed groups suffer from the intersectional or intersection of gender with other systems of power. But it is not less important to emphasize that we do not stand in solidarity with women only because they are women. And we don't see that feminism means equality in oppressive politics and oppressive roles, no. It is not important. Of course, I just criticized the Israeli, some Israeli feminist women, but I would talk also about the other side. We have many feminist and women organizations who are working against militarism and against war and against occupation, some of whom uh, we see here with us. It's important to emphasize that women are as sex are not necessarily better than men as sex. Thus, we support women as an oppressed gender, not as a biological bodies. Maybe as biological, as, as you said, as situated biological bodies, not the biological body itself, mm -hmm. but its situation and politic in, in systems of power. Adopting this perspective, I will elaborate uh, what I mean by academic oppression and violence and academic violence, and then propose feminist research committed to transitional justice in researching women and gender relations among the Palestinian women. Academic oppression is done when the research on Palestinian women is blind to the history of these women, and when this research does not recognize the Nakba in 48 as a constitutive event for the Palestinian citizens in Israel, and to the women among them. And it's, of course, gendered. A scholarship is flawed, and not only morally, which is very important, of course, but also academically. This, I mean this scholarship. Even if we don't address the moral question of denying and acknowledging the Nakba and its circumstances, which is very important and inevitable in the context of talking about transitional justice. But such a research suffers also from academic failures. Because cultural and social and religious phenomena can be understood, cannot be understood in, isolated, in isolation or isolated from history, where the vast majority of people were displaced and the vast majority of its villages and its metropolis were demolished. The blind research of, on Palestinian women's absence from the public sphere, like I mean that, just for example, this blind research consciously or unconsciously reads and analyzes, for example, the Palestinian women's absence from the public sphere and unemployment among these women as a result only or mainly of their culture and religious values. Feminist Orientalism, in this case, covers up the colonial practices such as land confiscation and deurbanization and political persecution. Dealing with women killing or polygamy only or mainly as a cultural or religious phenomena that women in the Arab patriarchal society suffer from is an academic violence that is blind to the, in the best, at best blind to the cooperation between the political system and the patriarchal system. Um, I won't give examples of Palestinian scholars who talked about this, but if we, if we need, uh, we can make it in the discussion. Transitional justice in this case means reading and analyzing the Palestinian women as an indigenous group living in their own lands, not Arab or Muslim immigrants in so-called liberal Western state, but and also not women citizens in their post-colonial states as their sisters in the Arab and Muslim world who confronted and still confronting military or tyrannic post-colonial state. Transitional justice mean, ac means acknowledging the Nakba and its consequences on the women and their gender. The women who were part of the family provision and the family economy and became only housewives who should care for their home and should protect their honor after losing the land. Transitional justice requires feminist researchers to, re I promised not to pass, I didn't pass the 20, right? Okay. <laughs> Transitional justice requires feminist researchers to re realize that culture is not static and religion institutions are not static, but rather interacting with the state, the economy, and the global changes. 
So women in this case are not oppressed because they are Muslims, but because the personal status laws in Israel for Muslims was enacted before more than 100 years and were changed, was changed in all the Arab words, Arab and Muslim world, but not in the Israel, in the name of respecting our religion. Not to talk about the women and the Christian church, churches and the Christian uh, um, courts. If you like, we can talk about it in the, in the discussion. Transitional justice in this kind of research analyzes the politics of the Palestinian women, not in separation from the fact that as a result of the Nakba, all the cultural and political institutions that existed before the Nakba were demolished, and that the Palestinian society in Israel was isolated from the rest of the Palestinian and the rest of the Arab people, and lived for 20, about 20 years under military regime rule, and was prevented from any kind of organization, and of course, exposed to political pursuit which still exists, of course. Only for example, in my research, I'm focused on the women in the Islamic movement. Acknowledging the history in this case is aware that the Islamic movement in Israel started in the 70s. But before the Nakba, more than 25 branches of the Muslim Brothers were established in the Palestinian cities and villages. Whether I agree, support, criticize, but this is the fact. And I must also be aware the, to the fact that the prime minister using the emergency laws declared the northern branch of the Islamic movement as illegal before three years. Thus, I cannot read the lack of representation of the women in the formal decision-making bodies of the Islamic movement only as a religious or cultural issue, especially when we see that women in the Islamic movement in all the countries in the Middle East were represented or at least the struggle for the struggle for this representation. And you just talked about the banning of the Palestinian human rights organizations, and you focus especially on the women committees. Same thing happened after the what does this mean banning the Islamic movement? It's not registered as party because they don't go to the Knesset, the northern one. But this means um, uh, making against the Loha Mahrizim Kilochuki um Illegal, more than 25 organizations, among them six or seven organizations who helped women, helped children, assisted women to go outside of their, of their houses. Again, uh, doing feminist and research from a transitional justice perspective should be aware of all these inter intersections, and thank you. Such richness, wow, I was like taking too many notes. So I know that we're running late, but we're gonna take some questions. 15 minutes, 15 minutes. okay. Um, so we'll open the floor up. Who would like to go first? Okay. Thank you very much for really, really rich and interesting. And although they are in different areas, I have my own interest in, in this field. So I'm, I'm bringing you all to my world. So. Chris, also from where you started, in a way, you labeled your presentation as moving from persecution, prosecutions to truth-telling. But actually, you're not interested in truth-telling. You're interested in something else, if I un understand the end of your presentation, which is uh, let's provide basic needs uh, for this population. So it brings me into... Um, and and maybe so yeah like you said those <coughs> basics so it's relating to the question of what is the relationship between transitional justice as you see it and peace building maybe and how do relate to state building what what is what is missing so much in all the contexts that we are talking about is the difference between how transitional justice was perceived for example, in Argentina in the beginning, to contexts that are so far away from that when you do not have a state that is functioning at all, right? So the, the problems are so different and therefore maybe implementing, this is one thing. And, and so my question is basically how transitional justice, and I think also for Arin, your starting point is like re reimagining what is the political space that we're talking about, right? Instead of looking only in the 67 borders, we actually expanding our look into the entire uh, realm and then asking political questions regarding to the whole territory and then reimagining what is the project that needs transition, right? Um, 
Yeah, I, okay, I'll end here. So thank you for three fabulous um, presentations. And um, what came up very strongly from these presentations are, uh, I think, three main three main points, which I would re very much like to, to, to think through more rigorously. First, about the victim-perpetrator distinction, uh, which was challenged here both by Chris and by Aryn, and the gendered uh, roles within this dichotomous, um, uh, dichotomy between victim and perpetrators. And I, and, I, and I wonder how it's not only to break down this dichotomy because, but it's also how gender plays a role in um, sustaining uh, the victim perpetrator's roles and how from different perspectives we should look about it differently. And so that's one line of thought that came very strongly from these discussions. The second one, and I think all three touched upon it, is that what the female discourse. So the female discourse has a strong oppressive uh, dimension when we bring it into transitional justice coming from LGBTQ uh, perspective, from masculinity perspective, and from the experience of Palestinian women. And I, I, th I, I would like you to elaborate it a bit more on how feminist discourse that uh, we all agree uh, surfaces a lot of extremely important points in regards to trans transitional justice also falls into that victim perpetrator uh, role in a sense. Um, and what that means perhaps for feminist organizations, uh, how should they restruct the way they work, the, the messages they portray, the way they uphold, again, the victim perpetrator discussion. And the third, line I think that was very common in these discussions is the fundamental aspects of what we as lawyers call social rights, but um, you know, land, poverty, health, education in um, addressing transitional justice. Chris even said that is a role for hope, not what we're talking about up until now in transitional justice. Irene mentioned it as fundamental in discussing the place of women, Palestinian women, the issues of land, of work, mm -hmm. and uh, of health. And uh, this came up also in uh, Finola's, of course, uh, talk earlier on. And again, I, I pushed to think how and in what way transitional justice institutions or uh, soft law mechanisms or um, 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 address this seriously because even in uh, Finula's answer to my question before, it's a very marginal part of you know peace processes, but it becomes so fundamental in understanding what is happening here. So how can we switch a bit uh, the perspective into the social aspects? I was going to add one more question for both of you. And I wanted Chris to talk about what Pasha talked about, which was scarcity, because I know that you and I smiled at each other and we understood. I just would like you to sort of think about what it means for this kind of competition over space that you see in surfacing the violence against men in the work that you do and how that plays out with feminists who are not your friends in this space often. Well, I mean, they are and they're not, <laughs> but they're not. Some of them are and some of them are not. I am, I'm your friend, but like, but I, okay, just want you to talk about scarcity. And I, I think both Irene and Pasha's not here, but coloniality is at the heart of this, so much of this. And um, I would be really interested, Irene, mean, to talk about how difficult it is to surface coloniality in general, to, to, to bring it up, to even talk about it, to say we can't deal with this unless we deal with coloniality and how difficult that is even with those who see themselves as your as fellow travelers with you. And I'd be interested in, okay. Yeah, quick, go, yes. Um, thank you. Uh, as we uh, talk more about challenges and bring up many challenges and Arin, like we're familiar, but just hearing uh, the many challenges that are there, 
I'm just wondering what is the role of the victims in transitional justice in that case? Uh, within this process, apart from providing the testimonies or being the victims, uh, what role do they have in this uh, process? Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you for a really f fascinating conversation. Uh, my name is Michal, I'm a postdoc at Minerva at the minute, so it's really great to see someone who was in Minerva. Um, I was uh, sort of bringing Chris and Irene's points together, I, I think this kind of material, material, materialization, like the military in as a form of violence seems really important, especially, and then bringing it back to this kind of the importance of also talking about women as oppressors. And I was wondering, it just made me think about, for instance, feminist organizations here, the way they maybe talk about violence against women a particular way, the way they adopt military practices to try and protect women. So I was just thinking, is there, do in terms of kind of expanding on that, do we also need to decolonize these feminist spaces? Um, so that's kind of one thing to think about. And then in terms of sort of bringing together this tension that we we keep getting at in terms of the transitional justice in a colonial setting where a state is perpetuating and the laws are perpetuating the colonialism and this kind of lack of reparation, I was just wondering if one potential, and you know, if we go away from the hard law and we think about it in a settler colonial context of land and the dispossession of land being so key, do we need to talk more about material reparation? And then what would that mean in a colonial context? in a feminist perspective. So maybe we're starting with homes. You know, there's a housing crisis at the minute which affects women in a particular way and indigenous groups in a particular way. So I don't know, I just felt that this kind of the perspective of space and material is maybe important to the debate as well. Chris, do you want to start? I don't think I can answer all the questions, but the one about, the two that connect for me, the one about, um, the, how would you restructure this course with or from the perspective of groups that are currently mar somewhat marginalized um, and the question about scarcity I mean, to me the way that we have begun to address it I, I think we, we started very much from what Pasha described of there's a gap. Where are the men? Where are LGBTI? And we need to fill that gap. And as we got deeper into that work, <coughs> started to get to a point where we had meaningful interaction with women, with men, with people who identified on top of being women and men or alongside their identities. Um, understanding the connections, not just from a sort of systemic point of view, but from a lived experience point of view. You know, and so evidentially, like if we were actually doing better, if we were better able to uncover the stories and see the connections, the, the scarcity argument just can't hold up because you start to see that it's in the interests of women survivors to also be working with their partners who are, 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 are survivors alongside them quite often and the other way around. Um, so the scarcity argument is, is actually self-defeating when you, in terms of the cases that I've worked with, there's been many cases where you've had two victims, one happens to be male, one happens to be female, and they're connected through their relationship and they're disconnected by the systems that are supposed to support them. And you know, so it's really about you know how how do we how do we get to that relationality? And this comes back to the first question. Um, I am absolutely interested in truth telling. I'm only interested in truth telling, but I'm also very very sure, having done it for the last fifteen years, that you don't get to truth when people are struggling with their basic needs. You just can't get there. And you know, let me go back to the male survivors. And I, I think this was, I'm, you know, it was before my time in terms of this field, but I'm sure it was the same for female survivors. Why on earth would you disclose if you're not going to get 
the kind of help that you urgently need. Mm -hmm. Because you're going to disclose, you're going to put yourself at risk, you're going to get excluded from your own social support systems. You don't do it. The only way you can get people to disclose is by putting in place proper interventions which can enable then people to get to a point where they're able to disclose. That is the only way that you will change the evidence base. Those statistics that I put up came out of trying to model what does it mean to identify at a very superficial level, identify people who may have been at risk of sexual violence and other harms, and where they tell you enough, just enough, to allow you to to get them access to proper medical investigation, which then leads to proper medical care. That's where those statistics came from. So, you know, I, I talk a lot about, instead of let's, this myth of evidence-based programming, we have to talk about programming-based evidence, because it's through the programming that we get to the evidence. <laughs> yes. And so, you know, I've spent a lot of time in the last few years really thinking about how because, of course, that has epistemological connotations, ontological connotations, blah, blah, blah. It's very, you know, we can theorize about it a lot. But the basic point is that the truth-telling doesn't happen until you've got some of that stuff in place. That's why, for me, you know, making sure that somebody gets access to the medical care that they need, that is transitional justice. It is not separate. It is not, I said pre-TJ, it's not pre. It's actually... You know, it's the foundation. It's the it's the it's the what do you call it? The, yeah, the foundation stones. Hmm? Mm -hmm. So you know, I really reject any kind of thing that I'm just interested in basic needs. My God, I'm so bored with basic needs. Mm -hmm. If you just do basic needs and you don't look at where does the, a proper provision of basic needs take you, and I'm interested in where it takes you, not you know, doing humanitarian support and giving everybody a blanket. <laughs> um, so I think that those would be my answers for now. And I, I think the, you know, the, the, the question about, I've forgotten how the phrase, the, the, the question about, I mean, that, the role of victims. Victims, thank you, yeah. I mean, what we're seeing now in the sexual violence field is, you know, the, the sort of rolling out of a, a rhetoric of survivor-centered approaches. But you know, I, I, if I had time, I could give you a whole presentation on how controlled that is, and from where, and how it, it continues to perpetuate a very, to my view, incomplete narrative, which is also not relational, doesn't look at the intersections. And you know, in a way, I think it's, it's just deploying, again, women's bodies for a different purpose. Right, and you know, so the survivor-centered justice is if you're listening to actually listening to what people's narratives are and what they say they need. And as I said, when you start listening to what people need, they don't start from prosecutions, not at all. They start from the needs, which will allow them to recover some sense of their own potential as human beings. That's, that's where it starts from. And yes, if, if that is in place, then the discussion moves on and you get to a discussion about how do we hold these people accountable. So the, the, the sort of fight about impunity is, to my mind, is very much a state-driven agenda rather than a, a victim-led agenda. Yeah. Thank you. I will uh, less answer questions and more be engaged with things you said because I don't have, you know, specific answers. I will start by the like, also this dichotomy with like truth and uh, and um, physical and uh, material needs. Of course, I believe it's for me is more important to have our lands back, to have the, the Palestinian refugees back, and to have, but also we care for the truth i want acknowledgement i want to to feel that our story our narrative is acknowledged of course i agree so i very agree with you but um but like i don't want to see that as dichotomies of course we need both and we should 
care for both. And from our perspectives, as as he said, if you ask Palestinian in one village now, he may would he may talk about their basic needs. We have hundreds of villages that do not have uh, water or basic resources. Okay, and we have Palestinian refugee in Lebanon who would say, "I want Palestine, and I want them to you know acknowledge or to revenge." Or so so there are many many different needs, and it doesn't have to be this and that. And the same dichotomy that I would like to talk when I speak now about the responsibility and the accountability of women, I was engaged only with colonial aspect and less with gendered aspects and with gender dynamic. But you know, when I sit with my colleagues, Palestinian intellectuals and politicians and academic, they talk about you know the role of this colonial uh, 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 regime, and they do not talk about how this gendered is and about gender dynamics. So there I have to fill the, the gap there, and I have to fill the gap here. And I see myself politically and academically engaged. And like this is not only political say, it's academic say, because academy fails when they don't see the intersectionality. So does the ac Palestinian academics, some of them, of course, and some of the Israeli academics. Um, um, I have to generalize. And, and this makes it very dichotomous, but, but, but only to show, you know, it's like we, in caricature, we make it bigger to show the, the picture. But I, like, I do it as a way of being engaged in dialogues, uh, political and feminist and academic. So I really, I, I feel the need to fill the gap depends on, you know, we say situated uh, knowledge and situated introducing knowledge. So this was this, I want just to, to talk about the victims, yeah, yeah, one, one minute. The victims, I don't see also this dichotomy. I am not, I am, I am victim, but I'm also survival, and I am also political activist, and I'm also intellectual, not me, I mean, as, as, as academic, like intellectual, and political actor. I am, someday you see me in, uh, in demonstrations, and someday you see me crying because of this uh, situation. So we are all, uh, we want us to be all, not only victims, but also activists and agents. Thank you very much. Sorry if I didn't answer everything.